Welcome to tonight's episode of Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel, and as always, I have a very special guest for you. Well, President Candidate Carrie Edwards, he'll be with us for the next 30 minutes, so stay with us. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV, where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Back, you're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel. Like I said, I have a very special guest for you. Mr. Carrie Edwards is here tonight. No stranger to the Beyond Focus family, but tonight he'll be, you know, in a different light because he is running for the official borough president for 2021. Yes. It's coming up yet again. Um, so it's a pleasure, and we love having you here, and the fact that you are running and so close to making the ticket and all that good stuff. Thank it's you, exciting. Man. It's exciting. Yeah, but yeah. before we even cover all that, there's a couple of things we want to get into. Yeah. Um, the lead-up. Lead We're going to get into borough president, but Brookdale Hospital, one Brooklyn Health in particular, right. you have been instrumental in making that happen in terms of the image you know brookdale hospital for anyone who's lived in brooklyn from brooklyn we know brookdale has come a long way <laughs> yes it is brookdale has come a long way um like any other hospital there's been issues but i think because of the proximity where it is the community it serves it's always had a little more of a struggle yeah. and in the last five seven years Brookdale has continuously grown. Its image has changed for the better. So talk about being instrumental and, and kudos for making that happen. I know it's not just you, it's a team of people, but you were definitely, a lot of that was a lot of your vision, your patience in making that happen. So let's talk about that. Um, I smile every time someone talks about that. Um, Brookdale for me was a labor of love. Um, an, an accidental label of love, actually. Um, on, the first time I was on your show, we spoke about being the first uh, man of color in the history of that hospital as an executive and the pressures of walking into that building. Um, I did a few years of uh, working at the state senate over doing health policy, and it was an option to go to either Downstate or Brookdale. And the irony for me is, you know, my two sons and my daughter were going to school in close proximity to Brookdale so it made sense mm -hmm. um, but what a journey it, it was when I first got in there I mean so how was it what what did you walk into I walked into a place where folks didn't trust the person that they were walk they were working next to I really? walked into a place where I was told that if you are an executive you don't talk to staff you don't talk to the building service folks you know everybody had what i felt was a class system um as i walked the halls people were, were so distrusting you know i was called uncle tom i was called a token it was it was insane um and then 1199 who i consider my family the entire 1199 union they were looking at me and like you know what do you think you're coming here to do and getting to understand the story of what happened to Brookdale through Medicis and through just being mistreated as a community hospital um, became a story that I had to tell. And understanding where 20 years ago your grandmother passed away and you never forgave Brookdale for that, or every time you turned on News 12, it was like the victim comes to Brookdale Come Hospital. Come here to die. Yeah, so it became this place that it was easy to talk bad about. Um, and trying to build the trust really just started with basic communication. You know, walking into the community and be like, look, I'm sorry. You know, or being very blunt with them. Look, you know, your, your cousin got shot. We couldn't save them. Or even talking about the time when your grandmother passed away, you know, we were in, in the right place. And how can I prove to you that we're in a good place? So it took a lot of, like, begging and pleading. It took a lot of building teams. It, trust um so it just became every day wow like I, I i wake up every morning and this was before i was married my girlfriend at the time was like you really get excited to go in and i'm like yeah because it's something new every day it was in brookdale 
Absolutely, and that's and that's amazing because you you can see the passion and the love that's there. Yeah. You're passionate about it. What was your strategy and your vision for Brookdale? Because we're seeing the vision now. We're seeing the fruits of the labor right. as a consumer who's now you don't have to have that fear of going to Brookdale or like oh take me take me to this hospital. I live in the zip code where Brookdale is going to be the first hospital I'm taking to. Right, right. But I feel comfortable and confident about that. Yeah, I mean, so I have a, a bunch of phrases I use, you know, hurt people, hurt people, um, put put people first, you know, and I think that when you support a community that has been misunderstood, a hospital, a bank, a supermarket in that community is going to get that same behavior. And I think hmm. what we had to do was show the people on the outside, the people that worked on the inside care just as much about you as you should care for yourself. So what we basically started to do is just start and started to put people in front of each other. Let's start having honest conversations. I remember going to community board 16 and I got cursed out. And they were like, you know, screw that place, screw you. And I, and I kept coming back. I kept coming back. And after a while, they're like, you're here for a reason. I'm like, because, you know, we want to save your life. We don't want you to come into the hospital and blame us for killing you when you come in, you know, with you know, stage four cancer or you have renal heart dis failure and, and then you blame us for not saving that. And we started to say that, you know, let's open up the hospital as a community hospital. We have a beautiful auditorium, we have classrooms. Basically we started doing inviting the community in. That's amazing. Yeah, moving, you know, you wanna come do your school play, you wanna have a meeting, I'm opening my doors for you for free and started to turn the hospital into a community beacon again mm -hmm. and not a place that people had to go and then you know credit to mark tony who was my ceo at the time that he started to move the needle in terms of making the medical side just as good as the community side that we're working out and i remember the uh, most upsetting argument we had one day we were open up a new urgent care center across the street from the hospital mm -hmm. And, you know, Mark's a white man from Maine. And I said, you know what, well, Mark, black people like new, nice, new, shiny things. And he was so flabbergasted and upset at me for saying that. And I was like, and he couldn't understand. He's like, why would you say that? And I said, when you give somebody something they could be proud of, they take care of it. Yep. And for years, Brookdale had no lights. The doors sucked. The, the customer service it was, was old. It yeah. was, we got the, the last, you could tell it was treated like. Right not on the same level as yeah. the other ones. Yeah. It was, so, it was a stepchild. Right. And so we started to, uh, you know, engage the elected officials, the Kevin Parkers, the Nick Perrys. We asked for new doors, new lights. We asked them to show up to things that they normally wouldn't show up to. We started to do um, slogan campaigns within the hospital. So people started having a good sense about coming to work, whereas before they just came to work to get the check and go home. And then we started having open conversations. We started, you know, finding out wh where people's birthdays were and, and all of these things. And now all of a sudden the staff felt like they belonged to this place. And speaking of the staff, a lot of the staff is mo the majority from the area, yeah. heavy West Indian community. Yeah. yeah, and they would not go to the hospital. They wouldn't even go there to do anything. I mean, I remember the one... Big conversation, you know, Charles Barron, who I absolutely adore, at the time, he's like, I wouldn't bring my dog to Brookdale. And so now you have a man representing a community and you have people that live on his block that work there and they agree with him. You know, and one of the, the mo moving parts for me was that I, I'm a type 1 diabetic, been a type 1 diabetic for 43 years this year. And I decided, to, you know, go to Brookdale for my care. And my, my 17 year old son, who was 12 at the time, was diagnosed with diabetes, type one, and almost died. And I brought him to Brookdale. And Brookdale saved his life, and we got him straight. And so go. therefore, I became my own, I became the client. Your own right? advocate, because <laughs> right. you had to wear the other shoe. And yeah. you had to be on the consumer side. Yeah. Like, this is, put your money where your mouth is. Right. Now you're, you're not just promoting the product or believing in the product, you are putting your child. Yeah. And so, Doesn't get more real than that. And, like, that's my everything. I remember being in a meeting, and he was upstairs in the pediatric floor, and I was like, I couldn't even finish the meeting. I was brought to tears because I'm like, my God, my child is here. And it became something where I walked the halls. I said hello to everybody every Christmas. I turned around and, and gave little bottles of wine to the food service folks and always hung out with the uh, building service folks. And I went, 4,100 employees, I went 
probably left knowing close to 2,000 by name. That's um, amazing. And, you know, I will say that, do I, was I born for this? No, but I, I, I enjoyed the chance to do for somebody and to do more. And that became the genesis for why I'm running for borough president. Exactly, and I love it. We'll hold that thought. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're watching Be Unfocused TV. Stay with us. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel. So let's talk about the journey to borough president because that was a decision. When did you decide officially that you wanted to make this next step? So whew, that decision was made out of, again, a labor of love. Um, understanding what the borough president's office means. It's, it's not city council. It's not state. Senator, or and whatever. explain to everybody at home what is that role? Because some people, like you said, are not clear on what a borough president does. Yeah, so so the role of borough president is very interesting. It is an elected position, but you are truly a man or woman of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, your your job is the ambassador, the uh, advocate for the entire borough of Brooklyn. Um, you work with elected officials, the city council, the mayor you know city controller but more so it's you bring attention to issues borough presidents can legislate you know a lot of folks don't realize that marty markowitz and eric adams could introduce legislation but they're really policy making um individuals who talk everything about land use community boards yes. but for me the the beautiful side of being a borough president is that you still get to interact with yeah. us. You know, you still do what I had to do with Brookdale and walk the floors and you walk the communities and you want to talk to people and make them feel that you're listening to them. You know, what, ha what happens to some of our legislators, and specifically the ones that go upstate, you know, they're upstate for four or five days of the week. And then you turn around, you come back, you try to engage with the community. And their staff does a lot of the work. City councils, they have stated meetings, they have things that they end up having to step away from the community. Even though the borough president sure has a million plus meetings, you get to go into Bay Ridge, you get to go into Brownfield, you get to you go into Bergen Beach and say, hey, look, what do you need? How can I do it? Um, one of the things I want to say on your camera, on your camera now, so that nobody else can steal it, is that one of the things that I want to change. Um, in terms of being the borough president is that even though everything happens in Borough Hall, for me it's a matter of I want to go to every legislator's office in Brooklyn. So I kind of want to bring Borough Hall to the community. I okay. kind of want to go to Alika Samuel's office or Justin Brennan's office and sit there and, and have the folks not have to travel on the train but come into the community to talk to me about what they need or what their issues are. I think that's more of a person-to-person -person dynamic field that a lot of borough presidents don't do. They sit in their office, and that's not who yeah, I it's am. it's kind of the only time you really see most of them is at an event, you know, certain right. key times of the year, Labor Day time, West right. Indian Day Parade, right. you're going to see them at the beginning of the parade. Like, yeah. they do it because, yes, they want to interact with the community, of course, but you know there's going to be certain key times you will see right. them. But other than right. that, it's like, where are they the rest of the time? Yeah, I mean, you know, my wife jokes with me. She's like, you know, you once you win this thing, you better promise to be home at a certain time. And I'm like, for sure, because when I wake up on a Tuesday, I'm going, like I said, I'm going to be in Bay Ridge. You know, on Wednesday, I'm going to be in Brownsville. You know, Thursday, I'm going to be in Crown Heights. So that you don't have to make an appointment to come see me at a place that, you know, if, if you're in Crown Heights, it's great, right? You take the four train. But if you're all the way in, you know, Bushwick, it's going to be a little harder to get to Borough Hall. So that's one of the thoughts that I have that I'm, you know, no one else has, so I'm saying it first on your show, so that I don't get that doesn't get Thank taken. You. Um, but it, it's it's a people position. Yes. And for me, like I said, turning 
Brookdale around. Um, again, it was a group effort, but I got to lead that effort. Yes. Um, what's going to be happening in Brooklyn and the city? We're talking about laying off 22,000 people. COVID has changed the landscape of how we interact. Um, and I was on the ground. Like, I sat there, and, and we, we brought attention to COVID issues. I was running up and down with your friend Sharon, you know, doing a lot of stuff, and then I got COVID. And it was the worst experience that I've ever had in my life and we just kept chipping away yeah and so I don't talk bad about any of my opponents but you know you have to show me someone that's been on the ground doing this period you definitely of time. are doing the people work which is really getting out there and doing that what do you think is going to be separating you from the other candidates um the fact that I do get a, a real understanding, the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, the other legislators who are running, they've been legislators. And Brookdale, even though it's in Brownsville, East New York, I have met folks from all over the borough. We've dealt with patients from all over the borough. We have staff from all over the borough. And so there's a, a true sense of unity that I can bring to the to the office. Um, that I do think is a little different. And I, and I do think, like, when the going gets tough, there's somebody who's been there with you. Um, and, and I think that, you know, like I said, COVID has been bad in so many ways, but it's opened up a perspective saying, how do we move, we shift over. And how has been that experience? Because you just shared with all of our viewers, you know, you personally had COVID. Mm -hmm. And thank thankfully, you recovered, yeah. you're safe, you, can, you can't even tell um, looking at you. Yeah. Um, but how was that dealing with COVID and still trying to prepare for this at the same time? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Um, when COVID hit, you know, the underserved communities, and I say that because it's not just black and brown, you know, there are my Asian brothers and sisters, you know, my Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, there's some folks from even, you know, the white community that have, that are underserved. And we took care of the brunt of folks. I know everybody heard about Elmhurst Hospital and Mount Sinai, but Brookdale lost over 600 people to COVID, and we were lacking supplies, and we were going through so much. And so spiritually for me, it wasn't good enough. And I, I let CNN into the hospital, and boy, did I get in trouble for letting CNN into the hospital. But I felt it was my duty because... We had people who were suffering wearing trash bags or reusing, you know, socks mm -hmm. on their shoes to protect themselves and people were dying and no one was talking about us. And so then that opened up the whole understanding to what COVID really means. And right. then, you know, I lost four or five uh, employees that I was very close to. And and then my my energy started to fade. And I, and I remember... The day I got COVID, which was insane, I remember going in on a Saturday and, you know, we were feeding folks on the 10th floor. And then I heard that one of the lieutenants who I was close to, he was in bad shape and he came into the um, emergency room. And then you know, Yvette Clark's staff called me and there was somebody else that just they just wanted to give her a message. And I was never great at wearing my mask in the first place, but I went into the emergency room and, and the air was so thick. And I remember looking up and I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. And I wiped my forehead and that was it. I was on the elevator. Well, hold that thought. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to continue with that thought. Okay. Watching Beyond Focus TV, stay with us. back you're watching beyond focus tv i'm lydia patel here with carrie edwards borough president candidate for 2021 so you're giving us your covid experience and you were literally telling us about the day you caught covid or you know that you came in contact with covid yeah so i i, I literally looked up and i wiped my brow and i was like wow i just got covid and i went home and and i wasn't feeling well i started coughing first sign and my wife's like oh you know what let me take your temperature. Temperature was fine, but I couldn't stop coughing. And two hours later, it was, my temperature was like 102. And then I was like, what am I going to do? And she started freaking out. 
I started freaking out, and then it went from there to 17 days of probably the worst experience of my life. I didn't. It felt like somebody was rubbing sandpaper on me every day. I woke up. Really? Day. Yeah. I, I had I had the body aches. I actually lost my hearing. I didn't lose my taste. Um, I had some respiratory issues, but not a, not anything bad. And and the part of COVID that messed me up was that um, it starts to take your will from you. You know, it, it's beating you up every day that it starts to take your will. And so many people who've passed away because they were isolated was probably one of the biggest factors that we never spoke about. You know, hmm. um, I, m- my wife stayed in the bed with me. Um, she didn't catch COVID. She, did, she didn't catch COVID. We think she might have had it earlier in the year before they knew what was going on. But she stayed in the bed, and I remembered one day she was trying to get me to eat, and I was like, leave me, leave me, I'm going to die. And she was like, oh, enough with you. And she went downstairs, and I went, and I sat out in my porch, and I started writing my memoirs. And I was like, and then I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to make it. And I go in the shower, and Lydia, I cried for probably an hour and a half. And I just, like, uncontrollably couldn't get myself together. And... Mm-hmm. You know, there are a few times that I could say to your listeners, especially, you know, our, our Caribbean folks, I heard God talk to me. Mm-hmm. And I heard God say, boy, nothing going to happen to you. Stop, yeah. <laughs> stop playing. <laughs> um, but he asked me to do something. And that was the changing point for me for wanting to run for office. So what I heard him say was, I need you to go to the hospital. And I need you to pray for all of those people that were in the trailer. And so when I left Brookdale, we had two trailers where because our yeah. mortgage was too much. When I got there, there were three. And so I didn't have enough lilies. And I sat there and I kneeled. And it was the day before. It was actually Easter Sunday. Mm-hmm. And I prayed. And I prayed for them because I remembered, you know, when you hear about people not going, praying, being prayed for in the middle passages and all of these things that were spiritual to me. And that moment, it was like, you know what? I need to, to see how I can be more giving to a, a greater group of people and, mm-hmm. and that and it's so funny that day temperature went away next morning like Amen. You see, yeah, and I and it just became that thing so that is that was my start in saying you know what, I'm really gonna do this thing and and you did it how do we get in contact with you now how do we support the cause you know of course donations are always gonna be welcome yes ma'am yes it is um, how do they donate? How do they? What's your site? Give us all your social. So my site is simple. It's uh, www.carrieedwards.com. Um, everything's on that website. Whether you want to donate, whether you want to volunteer, whether you want to just tell me you don't agree with my policies. Mm-hmm. Um, my policies are a huge factor for me. Healthcare, homelessness, the things that I think that start to divide us as a community. Um, I got to wear my Brooklyn vested shirt. So every yes. um, borough president has a not-for-profit arm to their political arm, and Marty Marcus, Marcus was best of Brooklyn. Eric was one Brooklyn, so once I win, mine will be Brooklyn. Brooklyn invested. Um, but again, it's it to get to me is www.carryedwards.com. K H A R I Edwards.com. Don't have a phone number yet, but you can get me on that that platform because. Only Lydia has my private number. I don't worry, I'm not, I'm not sharing that. We're not sharing that. But on the topic of homelessness, which has been, it seems like there's more of this issue. Yeah. It seems like there's more homeless people, especially the last six months of COVID. Yeah. Um, and you have concrete plans to try. That's one of your mandates that you are going to try yes. to make happen. I, I have a plan in my head, but on paper, that I think we'll be able to reduce homelessness in Brooklyn by 20%. And, and what I want to say to your viewers, honestly, is that there's a negative stigma to homelessness. Yeah. We think that just because we pass by the armory or we see, you know, folks strung out on drug, that's only homeless we have. While at Brookdale, and my wife works with DC 37, there's a strong percentage of their workforce who live in shelters. Why Brooklyn has got, has got become too expensive to live. Yeah. People aren't getting paid their living wage. We get rid of 22,000 jobs folks are going to be homeless and so my plan really is to deal with them first move them out of these shelters take the men and and the single women that you see on the corner without any support mechanisms you know one day we passed the armory and they were cooking crack right in front of the armory 
put them into these what used to be family shelters mm -hmm. and provide to them educational medical support so by, by the time they decide they want to come outside to do whatever they want to do they get that support before they walk out the door so now again it's much like the urgent care center you give them something to be proud of yeah. they're going to be proud of themselves and we want to move these working poor into full functioning homes for them like apartments not not just an AMI mandate but we want to put them in places where they can live for the next 20 30 years and support their family and grow their family and I think they they earned that so that's my number one policy piece. You got it. So, I so love it's it. It's on record. No one can it's steal it. It's on record. <laughs> um, and I'm excited. I'm really excited Thank for you. you. I know it's going to be amazing. You have my vote. Thank you. 200%. Um, definitely have my vote and my support because I know you from the work you were doing at Brookdale, the stuff you were doing with the bid. I mean, you, you. you are the real deal. Everyone at home, Carrie Edwards is the real Thank deal. You. And he definitely deserves to be borough president he's going to represent us the best possible way so my full endorsement right here I'll on be on focus um and we're excited and we'll have you back again early 2021 when it's time to get another nomination and get all that good stuff we'll have you back yeah i, I have to touch all your viewers seven times so this hopefully will get repeated and i'll get four out of it and then we'll come back we'll, after we'll be back again <laughs> all <laughs> right thank you for having me you're very welcome as always if you have any questions or comments you can send us an email at info at beyondfocusedmedia.com i'm your host lydia patel thank you so much for joining us and we'll be back again next week same time same place you're watching beyond focus tv stay with us Beyond Focus TV show wants and needs your feedback. Did we blunder? Please let us know so we can improve. Was the show helpful to you? Drop us a note so we can share the success with our staff members. Is there something you think we could do better? We welcome new ideas and new approaches to old ideas. Do you have a great suggestion? Let us know and we'll work on it. If you would like to share your comments anonymously, please send us an email at info at beyondfocusmedia.com. If you want to get in touch with the executive producer directly, send him an email at gene at beyondfocusmedia.com. We really look forward to hearing we from really you. Look forward to hearing.